Let's take a look at the hardware that makes up the dry fire system and talk a little bit about how it works together. Now, of course, the simulator is the heart of the system and these two green boxes in the front here on the table are dry fire simulators. This one is what we call a single head unit and this is a dual head unit. The difference between the two units are, that, uh, is, are the number of targets that they can throw. A single head uh, simulator will throw one target at a time and is, that's its only limitations. In all other areas of software and capabilities, it's on a par with the dual head system. The, the dual head system having two heads allows you to throw simultaneous double targets. So if you shoot doubles of any sport, be it trap, skeet, sporting clays, and so forth, uh, the dual head system is the one that is necessary for you to use because it throws double targets. So let's take a look at the simulator and talk a little bit about how it works. On top of the green box here are what we call heads, the simulator heads. And these move in an X and a Y direction. Uh, they are driven by servos and they're controlled by your computer. So when you call pull, the simulator goes into action and it's going to throw a simulated target across the screen that you see behind me. The, the simulated target is going to generate or originate from this area up here where this is a laser. There's a red laser uh, that's going to project across the screen uh, and it's going to be driven by the servos and again controlled by your computer. As that's happening, this side of the head contains a digital camera. And that digital camera is tracking the laser that's flying across the wall. And it is looking for a bit of information that's going to come in the form of a pulse of light, infrared light, that's going to come out of the end of your barrel. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. So this is what generates the targets. Now, in 2001, when Dry Fire was first um, being conceived of and started as a company, the gentleman that, that worked on this did a fabulous job. And in fact, they went out and they studied the flight of clays for many months and they determined that there's over 16 different factors that affect how a clay flies. Some of the obvious ones are lift, mass, drag, gravity, um, altitude, temperature, air density. All these things affect how a clay flies. And because they took that into account when they wrote the software that drives the simulator, we are able to generate extremely accurate targets uh, indoors. And those targets uh, can be even be affected by wind. So for instance, if you plug in a wind component uh, into your simulator software, the targets on the wall will fly differently than if you're throwing targets in a non-windy environment. And if you think about it, that can be a very important thing to learn about, uh, not only philosophically or from a physics standpoint, what's happening to that target and your shot pattern, but also from a practical standpoint of being able to practice with wind uh, is very important. So for instance, let's say it's a, a Thursday afternoon or evening and you're practicing with your dry fire system. If you were to go out to the range, it's calm that day and all you're gonna get are calm targets. But you know from looking on the weather forecast that when you compete on Saturday, you're gonna have a pretty stout west wind. Well, with dry fire, you can plug in a west wind, uh, whatever speed you want and any compass direction you want and the targets will fly based on that. And so you can be practicing with this strong west wind even though it's calm outdoors and that's a real competitive advantage. One of the things that dry fire even takes into account is not only does wind affect how the clay flies, but if the winds are significant enough, it affects how your pellets fly and what they do. And a lot of people don't realize this, but let's just say at 40 yards, if you had a crosswind of 25 miles an hour at sea level, your shot pattern will move 15 inches by the time it hits out at 40 yards. So that's a pretty significant uh, consideration is that it's actually moving uh, your pattern also. But likewise, uh, if you're at altitude, let's just say you're up in Colorado and you're at approximately the altitude of uh, Denver and you're practicing, uh, that same wind is only gonna move your pattern seven and a half inches. So there is a, a perfect example of the environment uh, makes a difference in what's happening in your practice and in your results outdoors. And to use as an example, we had a, uh, <laughs> a dry fire user from Colorado, a gentleman in his 60s who's a skeet shooter, and he decided that he wanted to compete uh, more on a national level, which he had never done before. So with his dry fire system through the winter, he was practicing getting ready. 
and his goal was to compete in San Antonio, Texas in the spring, sometime in the March time frame. And if anybody has been in San Antonio in the spring, you know that it's often very windy. So this gentleman plugged in the altitude of, of uh, San Antonio, which is around 600 feet, and uh, uh, put in a, a very high wind component and practiced with that. And of course, he could not replicate either one of those in, at his local gun club. And so he was practicing with his simulator. And we got a call from him uh, one afternoon. He was almost out of breath. He was so excited that he had gotten into a shoot off, which he had never done before and he had actually won it. And he said it was an extremely windy day and it didn't bother him one bit. So he was very excited about that. So you can kind of think about the how this can come into play uh, for you as you practice so that not only do you get the reps, um, but you can have the environmental conditions plugged into the simulator and get to practice with that. So um, in addition to the target and the digital camera, this also on the back has a microphone and the microphone is listening for your voice. And so if you're practicing by yourself with a dry fire system, you don't need anybody to, to pull for you. You just call pull and it will release targets. That uh, microphone is also, uh, you can adjust the sensitivity. So if you are say practicing in the basement in the evening and you don't want to be bothering your family who's trying to go to sleep, you can turn the sensitivity up so you barely have to say anything and it'll throw a target. And likewise, if you have some background noise going on and uh, you can actually tone down the microphone so you have to holler quite loud in order to uh, throw the target. Uh, if, if you want to, uh, there is another item that we have, which is what we call the wireless remote release. And in any, what we call squad packs, which are for teams, uh, when teams of uh, up to five shooters can shoot with the dry fire system. So any team pack or squad pack gets this as, as a standard uh, part of the package. And, and what this does is this now puts the control of the release of the target into the hand of the person touching the button. So as you can imagine, if you have a youth group or a team or whatever that is practicing with dry fire, because the simulator can't differentiate between you calling pull and someone laughing or, or dropping something or closing a door, you have targets flying quite a bit. So with this, this puts in the hands of a human who can distinguish between someone calling pull and maybe some of those other noises that are referred to. So this is another piece of the, uh, what actually causes the targets to fly. Okay, so now we have to talk about how we configure your gun. And here's how we do that. We have to put a laser in the end of your gun. And again, this shoots infrared light. So when the target, the visible laser is flying across the wall, you're tracking it. You're going to shoot at it uh, just like you do outdoors with the same lead that you do. And when you touch off the trigger, a pulse of light hits on that screen in some proximity to the, to the target. The digital camera takes a picture of it, then runs it through the software. And then based on information that's specific to you about your choke, your shell, your point of impact, uh, how tall you are, the distance from your eye, eye to the end of the barrel, these things that you plug in one time in the beginning, it will give you a very customized feedback on a monitor, just like the one over my shoulder here, and it'll show you where the target is and where your pattern is in relation to the target and how much you missed perfect center, center of the pattern to the center of the target, in inches. And it'll also tell you the distance at which you would have broken that target. So we have to outfit your gun with an infrared laser. And I'm going to show you how we do that. What we do is we have what we call a barrel anchor. And a barrel anchor is a lightweight piece of aluminum that slides down into your barrel. You can still you can leave your uh, chokes in if you want to, so we can accommodate that. When you tighten this up, some soft rubber O-rings expand, and it holds this barrel anchor firmly in place. And then to that, we attach the, the uh, infrared laser. We tighten this with a set screw, and then we put a barrel clip on, which holds the wire in place. So, and then we, from there we shoot an alignment shot, which we'll talk about in another video, but that's how we get this perfectly aligned with your gun. So now we have a laser in the end of your gun shooting infrared light at the wall. Now there's two different ways that we fire that infrared laser. This is the first one that we're going to talk about, and we call this the acoustic trigger, and that's because this works off of sound. This red box is what we call a trigger box, has some electronic circuit in it, and in addition to that, there's a microphone. And that microphone is listening for your firing pin. When it hears your firing pin, it fires the laser at the end of, at the end of your gun. This attaches with a, a magnet, uh, 
and you just clip this on here, plug this in. So when I'm shooting with this method, this is as natural as it gets because when I mount my gun, I don't see the laser on the end of the gun, I don't see the red trigger box, and I don't feel anything on my trigger. So it's just me tracking that flying target, pulling the trigger, firing the laser, and that's, that's the, the way that we use when we call, call this the acoustic trigger. The other method that we have is what we call the mechanical trigger. And again, it has the same barrel anchor, same laser, and it has a different trigger box and a different way to fire that laser. Um, what we do with this one, we call the mechanical, is we attach a very small micro switch to the leading edge of your trigger. It has a little rubber strap here, so you just tighten it up in place, and now all you do is you touch that button, and that's what fires the laser. We can set this uh, switch up as a pull trigger or a release trigger. You can go back and forth. So if you're a pull guy, you just touch the button, that's what fires the laser. If you're a release person, uh, you can set this up as a release trigger and you can go back and forth however you want to. Now, the benefit of this particular method is that you don't actually dry fire your gun. Uh, you just touch the button. So when it comes to uh, practice, a lot of times we get the question, well, which one do you recommend? And we always say, well, it depends on, on you and what you're practicing. Uh, we really don't uh, steer people one way or the other. The nice thing of it is, is that every dry fire system comes with both triggers. And so if you, uh, you know, you can try, find out which one you like best. I will tell you that uh, folks that do a lot of high volume shooting, we've got, you know, quite a few people out there who may shoot somewhere between 500 and 800 dry fire targets a day on their system may not want to be using the acoustic where they're actually dry firing the gun. That's a lot of wear and tear on your firing pin and your gun and so forth. Um, and that's when this might be superior. Um, what some people do is when they're doing high volume practice, like I just talked about, they will use the mechanical switch. And then when they get ready to get ready to compete, maybe the day or two before they go to a competition, they'll switch over to the uh, acoustic method, so they're not doing as high a volume, but they're getting more in the natural rhythm and feeling their trigger again and so forth. So again, it's, it's a, we cover all the bases uh, with the triggers, and it's kind of up to you to determine which one you want to use. While we're talking about triggers, I will say that the majority of the youth programs use this mechanical trigger because, it'll, of course, it'll mount to any gun. And depending on what part of the country you go, a lot of the kids who shoot in some of the youth programs shoot with their hunting guns. And so if you have a, a pump or an automatic that, that you hunt with, you're also shooting a trap or skeet with, uh, it makes it very difficult to use the acoustic method. Um, and so th this is kind of the default. And the other thing is that a lot of coaches like to not have the commotion going on when you've got five athletes shooting and everybody's opening and closing their gun. It kind of just tones down a little bit. Uh, the, the commotion by having this where they just touch the button. But again, uh, you can do what, what works best for you and or your program. Uh, while we're still talking about the gun assemblies, the barrel anchors, uh, we're able to accommodate 28 gauge, 20 and 12 gauge guns. So the barrel anchors are what mate to the gun and then the laser will mount to any uh, barrel anchor. So, so we can accommodate a wide variety of, of shotguns. A uh, couple things that we want to talk about uh, as it relates to the equipment is that when it comes to the simulator, uh, that can be mounted in several different ways. There is a receptacle on the bottom that will mount into any standard tripod, like a camera tripod. So some people will mount theirs on a, on a camera tripod, just right side up in front of the wall. Uh, some people build a stand, uh, that kind of a dedicated stand that's a smaller profile. Maybe you don't have to worry about kicking the legs on the tripod and so forth. What some folks do is they put a bag of shot in the bottom that kind of anchors it. So that's kind of a, a, a nice sturdy way to fix it. And then the other way that you can mount it that we feel is very unique and, and very helpful is that you can actually mount the simulator upside down on the ceiling. And in fact, in this setup where we're going to be showing you, my simulator is on the ceiling right above my head. And so it's nice because it's completely out of the way. Uh, it's permanent. I don't have to set it up. Uh, it's always there. And as long as you tell the dry fire system in the software where the simulator is in relation in the room, how far it is from the wall, how far it is from the floor, 
and if it's upside down or right side up, and all measurements are made to this bubble level right here. Uh, if you tell it where it is, it will throw perfect targets whether it's right side up or upside down. So that's kind of a nice feature that uh, for those folks who have the ability to mount it on the ceiling, it's a permanent thing, it's out of the way, and that's pretty handy. In our next se uh, little uh, session here, we'll talk about your room layout, uh, how big a space do I need, where do I put my simulator, where do I put my floor stations, and so forth. So that's on the next video.